and he's found out that the average diabetic patient in this country spends about two and a half hours with a clinician. That means that they're spending 8,757 hours and 29 minutes on their own looking after their diabetes. And that's the huge elephant in the room, which is why I asked the question, do we have any patients here? Because actually, each and every one of us is a patient. But he's also talking about the fact that he doesn't want any surprises. He wants to know where he is now, so he's got access to his records, but he also wants to know about where the future um, lies. And so he loves the map of medicine as this patient pathway that helps him to understand where he is. And what he's finding is that by having access to the records and the map of medicine, it's helping him, him, helping us to improve our understanding of where he is in his own health. Is he alone? Is Yvonne alone? Well, actually, this graph shows uh, that out of our 12,200 patients, we've now got over 870 who've got access to their records. Down the bottom here are age... Um, let's see if I can do this. Down, down the bottom here, you can see age bands, so 0 to 4 right through to 90 plus. And up here are the percentage of patients in the practice who've got access to their records. So what you can see is that in every single age group, there are patients coming forwards wanting access to their records. The biggest group are between 35 and 75, and that's clearly the group with long-term conditions, people are being referred to the hospital for investigations and tests, people who are having regular blood tests done, monitoring done for cholesterol or kidney function or liver function or whatever. Um, I'm quite fascinated that the 90 plus, 13% of my patients above 90 who are male have got access to their records. It's probably more likely to be their families who are accessing it for them. But that's the point, is that the families are now taking on board this and starting to look at how the technology can help them get the best for themselves. Is it just in GP practices? Is there anything going on in secondary care as well? Well, I think the most exciting thing that's going on at the moment is around renal patient view. Um, renal patient view, the renal physicians have worked with the IT uh, managers and patients to create this view. Um, and the patients are able to um, log on and they can look at the test results as soon as they've become available. Most importantly, they can also see their transplant status. So when a patient is being put forwards for a kidney transplant, they know that they're on the active list and the patients have found that incredibly empowering to know that they're definitely on that list because it links directly to the UK uh, transplant service. Here's a screenshot of the blood tests that they can see, and for the clinicians in there, they'll see creatinines that are sky high, 724 and so on, which would scare the living daylights out of us. But actually, if you're a patient awaiting kidney dialysis, then those are the sorts of figures you're dealing with all the time, and it is nowhere near as scary for them because they can understand what it is, and they can present that to any department anywhere in the world if they need to. How many people are doing it? Well, there are 78 units across the country, 43 of them now have renal patient view. On average, 40% of patients either on dialysis or pre-dialysis in these units are now accessing their records, and on average, they're accessing it about twice a month. It's very, very exciting. So finally, I believe that empowered patients need access to their medical records and high-quality information about their care and how to manage it. Thank you very much. And my final thought is... Uh, each and every one of you, isn't it time that you got access to your records and that of your family? Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic question. How do we push record access when... Um, by the way, does any, how many people in this room knew that you could access your GP record? Okay, now that's really useful for this group because remember, we're at a mobile point of care conference I would argue that everyone here is probably three, four, five standard deviations ahead of the general population. And yet even in an audience like this, there's only a handful of people that know about it. So one of the issues is that people simply don't know that this sort of technology exists and that we're doing it. And I'd probably hazard to say uh, that we're actually ahead of the world um, on this in, in many ways. So, but, but nonetheless, most people still don't know much about it. I think the second issue is that even if you do know about it, have we got the processes in place to make it happen? If you could go to your, if every single one of you went to your GP today and said, can I have access to this record? Because I heard this doctor talking about it and a real patient saying it helps them. Uh, the chances are they may not actually know what they need to do. So we need to um, uh, create processes that make it as easy as being able to book a ticket online on BA.com or whatever it might be. So there's something about processes. Um, I firmly believe that I don't think at the moment, the culture is there for the NHS to suddenly embrace this and make it happen. I think we're going to have to build this partnership of trust between clinicians and patients, and I think patients and the public 
need to start to raise that as this is part of no decision about me without me, but actually not in a way of saying we don't want to do it without the clinician, we want to work together um, so that we can do it. So if I'm going to let my patients have access to the records, I'm hoping that they're not going to come back to sue me because I've forgotten something or not done something right or whatever it might be. The good news, by the way, is I've been doing this for five years. We've not had a single problem. The, the patient who sent the email didn't send a complaint into the practice manager. She sent an email saying, please fix my records. That's what I really want. And that's what patients and the public want. So there is something about trying to explain the realities of it. Um, I also think that um, I think the planets are coming together. I think the financial situation that we've got, the need to massively improve quality and constrain costs when managers and clinicians have done pretty well everything they possibly can means that I think over the next year or two, if we can all work together on this, we can support the culture change that's necessary so that we can get through the financial difficulties that we've got. And I would argue not just here in England or the UK, but actually around the globe. Um, we've just produced guidance that's been quality assured by the Royal College of GPs uh, the BMA was involved in those discussions, as were the Royal College of Physicians and the Royal College of Surgeons, and about 18 different patient groups, including Patient Voices, Diabetes UK, National Asthma Campaign. If you go onto my practice website, you'll see a direct link to the actual document that's quality showed by the RCGP, um, and that's been produced. Um, I had an email exchange with Kate Christensen from KP, Kaiser Permanente, um, and we are talking about patients here in the UK, people like Yvonne, as well as patients at Kaiser Permanente that have been leading on letting patients in the States have access to come together to produce some universal guidance uh, produced by patients for patients to help them understand how to share, uh, how, how to access records and how to make it useful. So I think we're moving into a very exciting time. Um, just in terms of, I think it's fantastic that people can come to you and sort of say there's been a problem um, with their records, how quickly is it possible to make those changes and who does it? Because I think very often that's the bit that's the hardest bit. It's very easy to look at the records, uh, point out the mistakes, but it's the follow-up because that's actually quite a lot of work. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. Uh, some of it's dead easy. Um, I, I've had situations where I've seen someone who's been complaining of pain in the right knee um, and then I've gone and written the consultation and I've written left knee and the patient sort of sent me an email or got back in touch with me the day after say, Dr. Han, you got it wrong. It wasn't my right knee, it was left knee. I said, oh yes, of course, silly me, um, and fixed it. And in fact, that's the, that's the audit cycle because when the patient can then go online and see that I've changed it, they feel as though they're being heard and listened to and they can see a difference being applied. So that's relatively easy. Um, you've then got on the other side of the coin, someone who's personality disordered and perhaps suffers with paranoid schizophrenia um, and uh, you know 20 years they're trying to get to a diagnosis or disagreeing with their consultants and everybody else around them to say this is not a diagnosis that I've got and that's much much more difficult um, to maintain and then you've got all the various shades in between as well. Th the point about this is by providing the same information that the clinician is using with the patient it helps to support a dialogue a communication and that's why my first slide today wasn't about some gee whiz IT stuff but saying actually I went into healthcare to help patients. Patients are coming to me because they want to try and get the best from healthcare. Let's use that as a basis for a dialogue and discussion. Let's provide the data that I'm using, as well as the evidence-based pathways, to help support that dis discussion. And it will continue to happen. There will never be any such thing as a perfect record. It's simply, um, if you think about it, at the moment we are recording what a clinician thinks of what's going on inside a consultation. Well, if you start thinking about it, maybe the patients should also be recording their version of it. Maybe they should start thinking about saying, these are the facts that we agree, because we know that was the blood pressure. These are the opinions that the doctor's saying about what's going on. These are the things I agree with, but actually these are the things I disagree with. And, and you can start to see the complexity of these things, but actually it's a narrative. And what's important is that we're continually looking at striving to try and get the best quality within the cost constraints that we have. A lot of the work is something we can do for ourselves. Um, somebody once said, what does it cost a patient to go to the doctors? And one reply was nothing. Everybody lives local anyway. But they're not, got, they're not taking into consideration the time. It can take a great deal for a patient to, a bit, to actually go to the doctors. When that appointment gets cancelled, maybe because somebody's ill, 
then it can actually make problems for the patient because it might have been booked in to fit in with, um, if they were a shift worker, for instance, they might have to wait for that shift to come back. So it's being able to control a lot of things themselves. So it's not necessary to go in to the doctors to get a blood test result. It's not necessary to go in to take your prescription to book an appointment. And the NHS in particular, they're very good with acronyms and they're also very good with buzzwords. And at the moment, the buzzword seems to be long-term conditions. But everybody's got a long-term condition. It's called life. But we should be starting treating that and looking after that life at the beginning of our health of the life, not at the end. So I'm saying to people, well, don't wait while you've got a condition that says, yes, I do need to get this regular. Get it now where it's not needed. And then when you do need it, it's there. Just to share an experience with you, we were hearing about some of the 3G connection problems and everything else. Um, I remember going out on a visit on a patient in his mid-50s, um, lives in a one-bedroom flat, so he's not got a lot of money, um, but um, he was feverish, not very well, and this is a chap whose kidneys functioning is, is worsening. It wasn't David, somebody else. And as I walked into the house, um, his wife said, Dr. Hannon, my husband's lying in bed feeling very sorry for himself, and by the way, his record is already up on the computer in the front room with all the test results and letters and everything else in case you need to use it. And at that point there, I suddenly saw a vision that we can easily do now. 70% of households in the UK already have broadband now. There is a digital policy to try and encourage everybody to move forwards and use the IT systems that we have. I think there's a great opportunity here for us to be able to open up the records and make them available for patients to use in their own workplace, home place, and everything else. I still do, however, think that there is going to be a need for our district nurses to have their own mobile point of care device for their own uh, requirements, security and everything else with it. So I'm not saying suddenly let's stop doing that and let's, let's rely on the public. Um, you, you'll then create a two, a two um, what's the word I'm thinking of, two-tier system with those that have got the IT and those that don't. 70% do, 30% don't. Um, so I do think that um, clinicians still need a point of device that enables them to deliver care. But I think if it can be enhanced by patients who've got access to their data, that could be a very, very exciting place. Thank you very much.